looking uh, in that dress room and not sitting in there that it must be a, uh, an absolute wonderful uh, environment to come into because of the people that are in there. Um, they, they are, we've talked about it so many times of how accepting they are, welcoming they are, and it starts with our captain, our two assistant captains. There's no animosity for a guy coming in and playing um, in different situations. They, they want that, they, they encourage that, um, and yeah, our leadership in that room um, has allowed us to have that depth and have those depth guys contribute um, because they feel comfortable not only on the ice, but they feel comfortable off the ice in the locker room and away from the game. A late night edition of Judd's Hockey Show uh, right now for you. Minnesota 8, Montreal 2, Zolgad and Declan Goff. Of course, the two uh, the two members of JHS, we were both there for that game. And uh, Declan, I don't know if you saw it, but uh, at Dean's press conference, and you just obviously played a soundbite from it, when he said that, I basically turned around and looked at you because mm-hmm. that is about sideways shot number 667 this season about what used to take place with this team and what is taking place now. Um, that quote, again, speaks volumes. And actually, that quote leads us to a very interesting place to discuss tonight's game. And it's this one. Now, Montreal stinks, okay? Blackhawks stink. Montreal's worse. The Wild beat them all. That's awesome. Um, But the starting point, in my opinion, is this. 123 into tonight's game, uh, on the first shot that Cam Talbot, who who we'll talk about um, in this episode as well, and the first shot that Cam Talbot faced, Mike Hoffman beat him for a goal. 123 in. It's a Monday night against a bad team. It's the exact type of game decks that the Minnesota Wild used to do this. They'd fall behind. And then they would either scuffle to win or they would flat out lose. Instead, this time, the Minnesota Wild scores the next one, two, three, four, five goals before Montreal scores again. The game is done with. And this is the evolution and the changing of this team um, because this was, this could have easily been a typical wild barely gets by Montreal stinks. I, I, and then they would say, well, we're happy that we won. And I think a lot of us would be like, really, you're happy with that performance tonight though. The performance was tremendous. The performance was dominating. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Kirill Kaprizov again, put on a clinic, uh, but this was this was another in a long line of signs of how different things are now and why this team actually does things the right way. Absolutely. Um, I mean, first shot on Cam Talbot, it goes in. And we both looked at each other and said, oh, welcome back, Cam Talbot. He hasn't played in about a month since the Winter Classic. And Montreal's not a good team. Yes, they went to the Stanley Cup last year. Yes, hockey is weird. Uh, sure. But Montreal went through a lot of changes this offseason. They lost some of their core players. They've been a mess. Shea Weber retires. Like. Gary Price is dealing with his own stuff off the ice. It, it, it's not too surprising to see Montreal hit the cliff once you start putting together all that stuff. But it would have been so typical of old wild for them to fall back into old habits, get beat by a team that has won like nine games all season, and instead they rebound for an 8-2 win. And you know what? I'll, I'll just do this. Let me just give a little celebratory crack of from my friends at Surly Brewing Company. Oh, I love it. Extra Citra, just for you, Judd there. You now, go. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a little sip here, a celebratory sip. Yeah, I'm not going to interrupt you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I thought it was uh, very impressive that they were able to get a, a another big win and continue this train going, man. Um, the Wild don't have a lot of home games from now for a little while. I think they're on the road for the next basically almost two weeks. Till the 12th. So take care of your points at home, which I thought was a big emphasis of the Wild tonight. And finally, not finally, but the fourth line, which started off for the Wild very strong this season, has kind of been kind of been flat the last few games because they've had to have so many players in and out of the lineup. And tonight you saw that fourth line really come together. Connor Dewar, I thought, had a great first period, and then he gets rewarded with the goal. Nico Sturm then gets in on the party right afterwards as well. 
I mean, really nothing you can complain about. If if you see a team that comes in here with nine wins and is one of the worst teams in the league, and you have aspirations of being one of the best teams, which the Wild do, you should kick their ass. Like, just mm-hmm. to be pretty frank, you should absolutely beat them up. And the Wild will be able to do that tonight. Absolutely. And so the score sheet uh, tonight, for, first of all, eight goals ties the franchise record, which I believe they announced in the press box. They've set six previous times, um, but eight goals from eight different players. Okay. Sturm, three points, one goal, two assists, led the team. Um, Kaprizov had two assists tonight. Goudreau, an assist. Uh, um, Goligoski, two points. The, the thing is, again, and this is what's so important, the, the scoring was spread out. And you're right, the fourth line played fantastic. Kaprizov did some stuff tonight I still can't believe I saw. Um, this team is is so much fun to watch. And look, they have to win a playoff series. Guys like Kaprizov have to play well in the playoffs. We are yet to see those things take place. But as far as being on the right track and as far as taking care of bad teams, and be, because the thing that used to frustrate me, Dex, was not the fact they couldn't beat bad teams, but it was it was sort of like the nonchalance of oh Montreal stinks we're not going to be concerned about this one and then they get themselves in, in trouble. Um, this team gets itself in trouble at times, but it doesn't do it because it's belligerent. It doesn't do it because of hubris. Um, it doesn't do it because it's not a team. And w- what we saw tonight in the sense of the points being distributed throughout, and also what we saw in the sense of guys sticking up for guys uh um Spurgeon took out so Spurgeon in the first period had what I consider to be a questionable hit he's to be clear he's not a, a dirty player Christian Dvorak suffered a concussion um if you go back and watch it it's not a great hit and I, I think that the league ultimately will review it and I won't be surprised if Spurgeon gets like a game um that being said in what the second period, somebody gave Spurgeon some trouble, mm-hmm. Got and good. and Hartman stepped right in. In the third period, Felino late in the period comes flying across the ice. The same type of thing. This feels like a team. This is a team. This is the the celebrations are real. They're not BS, um, and it's not grandstanding of I got my points or I got my goal. There is a level and I can't describe it exactly, but you could feel it. There is a level of happiness for others accomplishments that teams have. And, and a lot of collection of players don't have the wild has that. And I think it's incredibly important, um, especially in this sport but across the board, you need to see this ultimately to have a club that can be successful in the playoffs. It's not a coincidence that Dean Evison had that comment for the hundredth time, it seems, uh, this season about the vibe and the or- overall feel of that locker room because he saw it. He saw what the old guard looked like, and he and he's also been around a lot of these minor league players, or a lot of the players that were in the minors, I should say. He's been around Connor Dewar. He's been around... Nico Sturm, Kevin Fiali, even before he came to the wild, like he, he is very much aware of kind of the homegrown grinders, if you will, that have now come through the system of the wild who are contributing. Uh, though if, if, if the wild really do end up trading for a center and we had, there was a little bit of reckless speculation dropped by Frank Savelli um, earlier this evening that we'll maybe get into it on this show or a potential later show on, on Judd's hockey show or on Mackie and Judd. Um, if they if they really want to go out and, and maybe get a JT Miller or, or get someone that can add depth down the middle, they could potentially do that. But having that fourth line, a fourth line that's honed and that's reliable. Dean said in after two periods, he was kind of surprised when he realized their ice time, right? Like he said, like, oh, my gosh, we've only played those guys for six minutes. And, you know, at that point, after two periods, the wild up handsomely, he knew that, well, we're going to ride them a lot here in the next 20 because why would we play our starters and play key players in, ob- in an obvious blowout game? But 
it'd be really easy also for a coach to just say, no, screw it, we're going to keep what's working and not go back to basics and not give our fourth line a run because they now trust that fourth line. There's players in that fourth line that aren't just plug and play. Hey, they're in and out of the lineup. They're a healthy scratch. They don't contribute a lot. No, like Nico Sturm, Connor Duar, um, Brandon Duhame, and, and all these guys that have come in and out of that fourth line for them have been essential to them. And you need, what have we seen from, we always talk about trends in playoff hockey, Judd, mm -hmm. or trends in the NHL over the last 10 years. Remember when Johnny Goudreau got in a little bit, it kind of seemed like, oh, it's fun. It's going to be about these young, small, fast guys that move up and down the ice. And then the game kind of transitioned back to having bigger in physicality. And now I think what you're seeing for teams that are, have legitimate Stanley Cup aspirations are four lines that roll. Four lines and yep. four lines that can contribute all around. And for for that Sturm line to basically be its bread and butter tonight, good, good for them to get a, a not just get uh, not just get minutes, but get rewarded with goals and points because they actually put up and do a lot of good things for this team that get unnoticed in the box score. Mm -hmm. So I think it probably felt pretty damn good to go out there and beat up on a bad Montreal team and get some points out of it. So just having those four lines because we know what we're getting from Hartman and Kaprizov, right? The Fiala and Boldy connection, which I'm sure we'll get into, has continued just it, it, seeing it in person finally for the first time. It's a game changer, right? It's it a totally big game changer is. for your guy. But that fourth line of Sturm, and you know, I, I've accepted who Sturm is, but that doesn't mean that I don't think he's not an important player or, or part of this team's DNA long term. Getting the fourth line basically rolled out there and getting points, I thought was really big for them. The entire thing is this if you dress, you're going to play and you're going to be counted on to contribute. And that was not true for a long time. Um, the defenseman, Ben, right? Like no, no matter what we think of Ben, Ben is asked to contribute and he scored a goal tonight. Um, but Dean empowers to, to use that word. Dean Everson empowers his players where if you dress you are going to be at some point in time throughout the course of a game relied upon. And no one on your team is going to look at you sideways and say, you're playing right now? And that was the case here. Um, and I love the fact that these guys rely on, on basically, if you are with this team, you can be plugged in. And there won't be a, well, you're a fourth line guy. We really don't want to play you much. There will be a, no, go contribute. Go contribute. The feeling around this team is so different and so welcome. And again, I'll go back to saying this, and this was, was certainly not true of um, several previous incarnations of the Wild, and this was not true of the 2021 Vikings. It's a team. It feels like a team. Um, and that doesn't mean you don't have stars. Kirill Kaprizov's a superstar. Kirill Kaprizov is the greatest player in franchise history right now. I don't think it's debatable, but you know what? He's not, he's not an overbearing officious jerk who doesn't want others to be successful. When Dex, when they, when Kaprizov um, scored, got the assist, I think it was his second assist to, uh, tonight to get to 100 points in a tremendously short amount of time. And they put it up on the scoreboard during a TV timeout. And he got applause. And then it turned into a standing ovation. And then it turned into an elongated standing ovation, which is awesome because it was so spontaneous. Because you know right. what? He's got that little boy smile like, oh, shucks. This he is does. so. <laughs> but I mean, but but it's so. But all of these things are what go, in my opinion, into the stew of success. Like. If he's too cool for school and, you know, he's like, yeah, thanks a lot for that. But what happened was this spontaneous moment of, for lack of a better term, coolness. And, and like I've seen this before, the twins, 87, no question, had this with mm -hmm. Puckett. Like it turned into this lovable group of, oh, my God, these guys are easy to root for. And and teams that are successful have that gene. And I I don't know exactly how to explain it, but I've seen it. This team has that gene. And this is not to say that, that they're going to make an extended playoff run. It is not to say that they're going to win a Stanley Cup. It is to say that the primary ingredients that go into those type of runs 
the foundation is being laid and it, it involves the team. It involves the coaches and hell it can involve the fans too, but there is a special feeling about this group that I don't think we've seen with this franchise since the Western conference finals team in 03, which was just really a fun thing. Mm -hmm. And it's like this magical carpet ride. When's it going to end with this group? Mix in star power because you've got some here now and it goes beyond that. And it's really special to have a team that's this talented have this feeling. Absolutely. My guy Devlin here pops up a comment says this is the deepest wild team ever and they will win the cup. Beat Sampa. Hashtag write that down. You go, uh, Devlin. Love, love the Devlin optimism here. Hey, by the way, just really quick if uh, uh, Devlin's a loyal listener here of Score North and uh, he's actually going through a little bit of rough times. He has a GoFundMe going right now. He's giving away some cool Twins gear and Negro League balls. Um, uh, some some Minnesota Twins players like Trevor Plouffe and Glenn Perkins have also donated. Nice. If you want to help out my guy Devlin, go to my Twitter page. I tweeted out his little GoFundMe. Uh, him and his family really appreciate that. He's a loyal listener of Score North, so we um, we got your back. We appreciate you there, Devlin. Absolutely. But also just kind of uh, to your point of the selflessness and how different this team feels. I I think Jordy uh, Jordy Ben's comments today were in the post game very 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 telling mm-hmm. because. I think Ben, unfortunately, has been this victim of, like, Kalen Addison should be playing. You and I talked on Saturday. Kalen Addison should probably be playing. He's a more talented player. He fits the mold of what the Wild want to do. And and Ben has played admirably. Um, he wasn't even a pristine player tonight, even in an 8-2 win, even though he does get his first goal of the season um, and and helps the Wild with the win. But his postgame comments of him discussing how, hey, I'm well aware that when Jonas Brodin comes back, I'm out of this lineup. Like mm-hmm. I, I, he's a better player. He means more to this team, and I know that my, my playing time probably will be cut or just be healthy scratch because of Brodine's eventual return to the lineup. Sure. And then for him to also say, "Hey, like and Jordy Ben's been around. You know, he, he he's been on some playoff contending teams, and he was asked how deep this team feels and how different he how different it feels, and he was very complimentary. And it wasn't a cliche answer. So I think he was like, "Man, this is this is something I haven't I haven't really experienced a lot of before, right?" And, and Jordy Ben, to be a veteran guy who kind of knows where he where, has been around the block and knows what I think the DNA looks like of that, and a grinder and someone who has that awareness to, to know that, hey, my playing time might be sacrificed here because Brodeen, I'm well aware of how special of a player he is, and I need he needs to be back in this lineup for us to really make a run to the Stanley Cup. And then to him also compliment the whole vibe and culture of that room. That's where, you know, Bill Guerin, man, I mean, friend of the show, but this dude definitely knows what it takes and knows the players he's bringing in for this to feel like a championship contender. He brought in Ian Cole last year and Nick Benino for those reasons. He's brought in John Merrill and Dmitry Kulikov and now Jordy Ben um, for those same reasons, that they have a different feel for them. And they might not be household names. They might not put up a ton of points, but they mean a hell of a lot in that room, and they're not an I player, not a me player, right? It's, it's all about buying into the Correct. overall goal of this team. Correct. And hockey players will always give you a cliche answer and tell you, and there's even a promo that the NHL runs, it's no I in us. It's all about we or whatever. Mm-hmm. There are tons of selfish hockey players, tons of selfish athletes in this town and in all sorts of leagues that will give you that same BS spin. Just from my BS detector, uh, I, I don't detect a lot of BS from what, what Ben was saying there in the post-game press conference. I really think it was, was heartfelt and it was thoughtful, and he was completely accurate on what he assesses the well can be. I think the most important thing about that point, too, is is this. The locker room culture of a team can't allow that. And, and I don't think that's allowed here. And that's incredibly important. And, and it's why a trade, um, potentially for a player, has to be – has to go beyond his stats. Um, Bill Guerin's built – and Dean too, a locker room here that's really special, and and I think it's sincere. Guys, uh, guys cheer for each other. Uh, the first line guys cheer for the fourth line, and the and the third line guys cheer for the second. Uh, incredibly important things. And yes, I think what Ben said. I think he was being one hundred percent sincere, and he knows it to be true. And. The most important thing is you can't have a room where anybody allows something different to creep in. And they don't. And they don't. In in fact, Sturm, post-game, 
uh, said tonight, the attitude is we want to win every game. That's changed so much since I came in the locker room. And, and to me, that's an incredibly important and telling comment because it's not just about um, a lack of selfishness or the presence of being selfish, Declan. That quote is basically, there was a time, and I think this is true, where if we won a couple games consecutively and we lost the third one, ah, it's fine, right? Mm-hmm. They literally now, and, and I mean, it seems so simplistic and no duh and stupid, but it's not. They literally now go into each game saying, we need to take care of business tonight. And, and that in itself is so instrumental. And it's why you, you can sweep the Blackhawks. And then on an arbitrary Monday night in, in which you surrender a goal, a minute plus in, come back and say, bleep this, five goals. Um, it's just the DNA of building a championship team goes so much beyond star power and statistics um, and e- even beyond on ice, on court, or on field play, because it goes into the locker room. It goes into all so many different things. And when a fourth line guy, I love that quote. When a fourth line guy says, "We want to win every game," and I can't tell you how much that's changed. <laughs> so important. Uh, what, what's your thought on Cam Talbot starting t- uh, tonight? According to Dean, uh, he tweaked. He tweaked the lower body injury he had previously, which he suffered in the Winter Classic against the Blues. He could have played the third, but they were being cautious. And the last thing is, they said it's not the it's it's the same area as far as what's wrong, but it's slightly different, which I'm not sure I get completely. But I'm guessing it's something like a groin. So we were just talking about BS detecting. Um, mm-hmm. Judging from Everson's comments, there something's something's up here yeah. Some, something's wrong um that's not to say that talbot uh there should be a full-on panic here and i don't want to put words in talbot's mouth or everson's mouth but just reading what everson said about cam talbot's situation there's cause for concern mm-hmm. uh, he, he he they said on the i believe i saw a graphic when i was walking in the press box that you know well, he took extra time to get to 100 percent, and that could be true but He's clearly not 100%. And if he was 100%, he would have gutted that out and played the rest of the game. I understand why Dean pulled him in, in a in a game that was already over. And, hey, capo has been playing well. Just we'll throw in Capo for a meaningless game. You could throw in Beaupre if you wanted to as the e-bug for the last 30, 20 minutes. It wouldn't have mattered. Hey, Connor would be great. He would be great. Um, but I, there is something of concern here. And capo has been great. Capo has delivered and beaten up on the teams he should be beating up on. But to our point and what we were talking last Saturday on the last pod we did, the Wild need two goalies here. So yeah. even with how great Capo is playing, you can't ride Capo for 80% of these games. Nope. And if and if Talbot is indeed not 100%, then you will, unfor- maybe unfortunately, but fortunately, have to acquire a goaltender. You'll have to figure that part out um, because you can't ride Capo for that entire time. And we'll we'll you know we'll see what happens with Talbot. He might still get the run in New York on Friday, but judging uh, just by initial, no, my initial I think you're gut, right. I don't think this is. I think good. you're right. I don't think this is good news. It's got to be like a groin, right? Yeah, I mean, because lower it's, body and it's well, goalie and, and it's something that you would hurt again, so it wouldn't mm-hmm. be. I don't think it would be a knee, right, or something like that. I'm I'm guessing a groin, but anyway, yeah, I'm with you. And and look and. To be clear, I've t- talked about this a lot before. It's sports. It's sports lying, so I don't care. It's not like oh, Dean should tell the truth, uh, but the reality is, they wouldn't have pulled him out of that game unless they were concerned. And there, and and they also said that we're going to evaluate it again tomorrow, which means that it could be worse. Who knows? So yeah, it'll be interesting though because Capo Capo's played well. I think that you can ride him to a certain point. I think you're spot on. I don't think that you can just say Capo's net. And just to give give people an idea of what the schedule is like now with the Olympic break wiped out and the team will continue to play. Um, they play the Rangers on the 28th, which is what, Friday? Correct. They play, they play 
the Islanders two days after. Then on the second, they play again against the Blackhawks. Then on the eighth, they play the Jets. Uh, and then they come home and play the Hurricanes on the 12th, the Red Wings on the 14th, at the Jets on the 16th, uh, the Panthers on the 18th. They basically start at that point in time. They're playing a game every other day. And, and so the tricky thing there, Declan, is this one. If Talbot is if Talbot ha- has a problem that can be, unfortunately, easily tweaked, uh, you can put him back in there, but there's no guarantee he can stay there. So I wouldn't panic. I would say, as Dean said, it's definite cause for concern. It's definite cause for concern. And if you can't play, if Cam's going to miss or can't stay in for an extended period of time, do you trust Hammond behind Capo? It appears that they probably don't. Um, And then this team is so good, you almost certainly have to go get a goaltender in a trade of some sort. It doesn't have to be a great goaltender, but it has to be a competent one. So this could definitely throw a fly in the ointment. I I think that's a fair way to state it. It could throw a fly in the ointment of what you're going to do because that schedule is going to become so aggressive. You essentially need to have two goaltenders who you at least trust. It yeah. can't be I trust one of them, and I sort of don't trust the other, but he's going to have to play. Yeah, I think it's something like 40 games in 72 days or, or something. Not, I'm exaggerating a little bit there, but yep, starting in nuts. February with the Olympics, now NHL not reporting the Olympics, you're going to have a ton of games and a ton of back-to-backs and only one day off and a ton of traveling. You need two goalies. Every team needs two goalies. Colorado's going to have to figure out a different solution behind Kemper, at least to tag team well, it they, there, right? Might, yeah, or with Kemper. So, so it's not just the, this is not just a wild problem. And look, the Wild have made got their points. They've made their hey, this is good. They've built up a cushion. They've yeah. been they've had days off. They've only played a few games over the last month or so. You'd like to see them play more, but they have the second best point percentage, I believe, in the West behind only Colorado. They've gotten points. And they should be getting points. That's all good and gravy. I love that. But you can't be then just relying on Capo Kakinen because well he played well over these last six starts you can't and they won't they can't uh, no. a, a Devin Dubnik situation where he starts 39 they, consecutive no. damn those days games. are gone no those days are gone Dex you can't do that so you have to figure out either is that Andrew Hammond well god I, I don't think so I I, he I think he would have played by now yeah if they trust him at all yeah. don't you yeah and I know I, I see you know Jasper Wallstead that that ain't it adding in either and as, as much as, out, as, no. as exciting that could be no that's not going to be it either yeah don't um, trade him though because I know that you've talked about trading him and you got a lot of pushback and I appreciated I, the fact that Twitter came right back at you don't trade Jasper Wallstead but yes he is not coming up he's not going to be in goal for a few years Thomas Hurdle I uh I'd consider it. I'm not so doing no 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 it. I'm not doing no uh, I would consider stop it. I would consider it. first round pick absolutely Jasper, Jasper Wallstead no I'm not doing that um, let's t- talk about the, the chemistry that has developed between your guy Fiala and Boldy. But before we do that, let's talk about my weight loss. In fact, you want to talk about chemistry, yeah. chemistry between Judd Zolgad and the fine folks at Livia weight control centers is fantastic. In fact, you know what they are? I'm the right wing, but they are the pivot. They are, they are the linchpin to the fact that I have lost 30 plus pounds and now I want you to join me on this weight loss journey that that's been so great for me with the Livia. I did an eight week challenge where you get your first eight weeks for free. And I will remind you that in the first eight weeks, I dropped 26 pounds. So essentially what I'm saying is by springtime, you can be down 26 pounds and not have written a check yet, not have made a payment yet. First eight weeks are free 855 go L I V E A or uh, go online Livia.com L I V E A.com. And one last thing in town, you join them, you can go see them, but let's say that, that you're a fan of uh, JHS in California, right? Declan or Florida oh, yeah. right. or Florida Livia.com consultation via zoom. You can sign up, you can join the consultations can just be, be done as I said, uh, on Zoom, and you can lose the weight from anywhere in this fine country. If you're a wild fan, take advantage. 855 go Livia, Livia, L I V E A dot com. All right. 
Now, you, you gave me some grief in the press box, and I didn't appreciate it because I have always been a staunch supporter of your guy, 22. But you are right. Kevin Fiala and Boldy. Boldy's presence takes Kevin from being a good player who seems to go through some tough times, partially because he lacked the, the quality of line mates that Kirill Kaprizov had, um, to now to now ha- having what I would call um, his own personal Zuccarello type. Yeah. And the mm-hmm. difference in Kevin Fiala's game and play, and dare I say engagement, is noticeable. Yeah. Uh, every Batman needs a Robin, man. Every Batman needs a Robin. Maybe you need a maybe need an Alfred. I'm gonna go full nerd here. All these references are going right over Judd's head. Uh, maybe Matthew no Bobby Batman, needs... Ro- Batman and Ro- Robin. I get, and you got I get, it. I totally you get Alfred too. I totally get Alfred. I don't think He's I get the butler to. Uh, to, to oh, I knew That's... I knew Alfred. I yeah, figured you were yes. There. But now you're gonna lose me. Yes, but uh, I will say this is exactly what Kevin Fiala has needed. Fiala's been on fire too, by the way. Over the last nine games, he has points in nine consecutive day uh, games here. He scored again tonight, and just looking at what they've done, Boldy and Fiala, that is on the ice, has been pretty damn impressive. Um. Both Boldy has not uh, has spent the most time with Fiala this season. Seventy two minutes uh, so far. Both these two guys have been on the ice to, on all strength situations. Mm-hmm. Um, they have a Corsi four of fifty five percent when sharing the ice, and this is again this is five on five. This is power play time, so it counts for all the times these two dudes have shared the ice together. Um, their Corsi four is fifty five percent, so when they're on the ice, they're out shooting their opponent. They have created six goals. They have only allowed two goals while on the ice, so you can make that as a plus four. So they've been creating more goals than they're allowing. And the deployment of them, I think this is an important statistic too. Fiala and Boldy have started in the offensive zone when a faceoff has happened seventy two percent of the time. Okay. So, so so when they are starting in an off in any of the zones, neutral offense defense. They are being deployed in the offensive zone because they're offensive playmakers that can complement one another. So the Wild are surrounding them in situations that employ their strengths. And this is exactly what Fiala has needed. Like Frederick Goudreau is along for the ride a little bit right now. He's been their center mate. Yeah. But and, and you and I have kind of watched the up and down battle with Frederick Goudreau. We, we thought at first at the signing, like, well, who is this slappy, as we love to say? Like then we kind of said, you know what? He's got some speed. This guy's not a slappy. And we've kind of now, I think, morphed into the middle ground of, all right, we, he's not a slappy, but he's not anything special either. Right. He's a guy. He, he's helping out this team. That's fine. Yes, sir. Now, can you plug and play him and put him with two dynamic wingers in Fiala and Boldy? And Fiala and Boldy don't necessarily need a facilitator between the two because they're both playmakers themselves, right? So it's not to say that Correct. the center is irrelevant because that's not true. Victor Positionless Rask, hockey. Yes. I love where you're going. Vic, Vic, Victor I agree Rask completely. could be a detriment between these two. However, yes. Fiala and Boldy have complemented each other's skill. Fiala was so stuck in a rut for the first 25 he games need, here. He needs, he needs someone to set him up. Yep. And he doesn't Boldy, have the ability to make plays by himself consistently. And Boldy, eye test wise, finally seeing him in person, the dude is a strong skater, moves ox. up and down the ice. Yeah, I mean an ox. That is that's a good way to look at it. Love and it. and and Fiala has dynamic ability and just needs someone to help him out a little bit. I, I don't think Boldy is necessarily going to at least at this point in his career. I don't know if Boldy is going to be a defensive stalwart and be a, a, a solid or a high end, I should say, two way player. I don't know that yet. But he definitely is not a liability defensively, you know. I think his skating helps him make up for that. And just in general, though, he's helped kind of take this pressure off yep. Kevin Fiala. That might be, and that's probably the, that's an unquantifiable but, thing. It's helped taking the pressure off Fiala to do too much. So, in my opinion, Boldy's skating is probably his his weakness. I mean, it's not terrible. It's not great. But here's a strength, and this is this cannot be taught. I think if you did a poll of the Wilds' current roster right now, Boldy's hockey sense is top five easily. It might be top three. His hockey sense is off the charts. He he doesn't get to places b- because of, of his skating. He gets to places because he sees the play a tick faster than most, which is an incredible attribute. And it allows him, I think to get to spaces, um, to set Kevin up, that works perfectly. 
Absolutely. And and I will give you a hot take. I, I got a hot take for you. Okay. And I, I'm i still on the fence if this is going to take place. But let's say Bill Guerin does pull off a trade. They get Miller from Vancouver. Hurdle. I don't know. But they get a... I think the assumption is Hartman's out. Hartman's out, and I don't think he is. I think if they pull off a trade, the center gets put with Boldy and Fiala. Because Hartman, Zuccarello, Kaprizov works yeah. really well. Yeah. And I don't think that you need to mix that up. Um, I also think that Dean, I, I think Dean is not interested in screwing with things that work. Because because he was finally basically persuaded. And look, we talked about this too and, and agreed. He was persuaded. You got to put Eck with Kaprizov. He's your best. He's your best center. You got to do it, right? Um, and he was always like, but I want, but I like Eck with, with Greenway and Felino, and he finally moved him right, and it didn't really work out too great. It, it didn't work out. So I think if if Billy Garrett pulls off the trade that we've speculated about, I actually think Goudreau is out, mm-hmm. and and the new guy is because if if you put a center like a real one with that line, you're now essentially going to roll a top six that is two number one lines. I don't, and and I think, I, and I think unless Hartman goes into like a prolonged funk, which I don't see, I don't think that it makes sense to say, well, we, we got this guy and Kaprizov's our best player. So we've got to put him with Kirill and Mats. I think it makes more sense to, to say putting Boldy and Fiala together basically took Fiala's game up a notch. Yep. What if we put a center who was a definite upgrade on Goudreau with those two? That's a top line, essentially, Declan. Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't even necessarily call it a hot take. I think it's an accurate take. Um, I, I, I think it would make the most sense. To, you're not going to screw with the Jack line, which has been your kind of shut down defensive line. Who had a it great just night tonight. And, and it, it just, just works. works and they Dean worked loves their it. ass off. Hartman, Zuccarello, Kaprizov, barring an injury, is, is solidified and fine but you would do it to make yourself deeper and to unlock even more of Fiala and Boldy. Like if, if it's JT, let's call it JT Miller. Let's call it JT Miller. That all of a sudden, like the wild have a very exciting, not just top six, but top nine. Like G- Goudreau yep. goes into the press box by default, not because of his play necessarily. Or Sturm gets traded. Or Sturm gets moved. In that deal. And Goudreau, Goudreau goes to the moved. fourth line. I, could see I don't think anyone's going to want Goudreau. I think someone might want Sturm. That, and that could happen. I can see that too. But I mean, but, you got. But but you're going to have to pay a price of some sort. Yeah, and it just basically look the JT Miller idea is Miller is under a fairly reasonable contract, so that that's why that makes sense. Another one, and and I think you and I will probably do an, a rec because now that Cervelli threw this out, you yeah, I think we need to get a to separate this. Um, reckless speculation <sighs> yeah. episode that we'll probably do even inside this one too. But we'll probably do even a separate one to explore all these. Yeah. And by the way, if you're watching this, hit the subscribe button on our YouTube channel for Daily Minnesota Sports Entertainment and Reckless Speculation, which we love to so specify much. on, on the Wild, on the so Wolves, much. and so much on the Vikings. Um, so hit the subscribe button if you love this kind of content. Uh, another one who I'm curious, because his team's reeling, and even though he's a rental, I don't think he's going to be – I don't think he's going to get a – the other team that is trying to trade him is not going to be able to get the haul that they want for him. Claude Giroux. Yeah, he's out – yes, that, that name – that name is out there. He will, I think, be moved. Billy Garrett and Chuck Fletcher, are you saying? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I could see that. And Giroux just – and Flyers are a mess. Here, here's the X factor part that we can come up with these fun trades that we love to discuss, and fans, yep. I know, throw some out as well. But the fun part uh, that Garrett gets to figure out is, is this guy an actual leader? I think Giroux is, just from – just from what he's been able to do in Philadelphia for a long time. That's a hard place to play. Phillies has kind of been stuck in the mud for the last few years. Um, What's his went, contract at? He's been to a cup. He's uh, he's a free agent this year. He's a, okay, he's so a rental. You, yep. So, well, I'm not saying the WoW can steal him because they can't just not no. give up something of, of significant uh, of a return because f- the Flyers are going to want something back. He's costly. And the Yeah, the, the problem is, is AAV is 8.2. Um, now – I don't think that's exactly 8.2 because you've played out half the season. So, like, there's yep. a curring 
salaries here, so they'd have to still swap out some money. But that is someone who I'd also keep an eye on on just reckless trade ideas because the Flyers are a that. mess. Fletcher That's could a be great. Fletcher and Yo. Everyone could be blown out there. Any oh, they're gone. To be completely honest, they're not oh, going to be there long term. Nope. Um, that is another name I would keep an eye on if I'm if I'm a Wild fan. Claude Giroux. Could you make a trade work for someone like that who has been there, done that, a veteran um, that the, could probably really help the Wild? He's 34 years old, but if you're going to go all in or do something just for one year and not pay the yes. piper long term, yes. Claude Giroux would be that guy. And I I think he is a more realistic name and target than hurdle is um yeah i think you could get him for a i think he'd be costly drew would i don't think you would have to break the bank hurdle i think you would probably have to break the bank and here's the thing i don't think bill garen will so so drew actually makes more sense and i also think that drew um is is a guy that is probably a guy Bill Guerin appreciates and likes like to me that to me, that name probably makes the most sense. Mm -hmm. Hurdle is going to be so expensive. And I don't think Bill is going to give up the farm to get him. Um, I do think that a first round draft pick could be in play. And if the flyers got drew, um, you know, take your pick a guy like Sturm back another draft pick, perhaps I think that that could get that done. I think if you traded, I think if you tried to get Hurdle Dex, the price tag would be a little bit too steep for for perhaps even you. Yeah. For Claude Giroux, I think you could probably, you might not be super pleased with, with what you would have to give up, but I think you could deal with it. And And look, if you plug another, especially the right guy, if you plug a, a center in with Fiala and Boldy, you're going into the playoffs potentially in great shape. Mm -hmm. Like I, I hesitate to get too excited here. Um, but you know, keep in mind as the wild learned against the golden Knights last spring, the playoffs are a different animal completely like teams shut you down. They, they make your life miserable caprice of. So if you could throw out two lines that can score, that starts to shift things a bit. Cause what we know is this, if you throw out one line that can really score and then, and then it's um, it's Goudreau and Boldy Fiala, and perhaps they can score, but you're not quite sure. Like it gets to be dicey, but if you can go six deep of guys and say, bring it on golden Knights or, or team X, Y, or Z that changes things. In fact, before we're done though, I want to tell you Dex and talk to you about line mates that we know here at score north work oh yeah and i'm talking about i'm talking about the support that you get when chill boys are are your teammate talk to me about chill boys and your experience with what i will tell you right now in my opinion first line center when it comes to long johns and boxers first line center in a 200 foot game there is no pun in that. It's just a 200 foot game that Chill Boys gives me. It's a it, it provides me comfort. It, it's 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 two ways. It's in the defensive zone. It's in the offensive zone. They keep you comfortable whether you're on the penalty kill or the power play, or you're just playing five on five hockey. Yeah, then that's the wild love to play five on five. They score a lot of goals five on five. So whether mm -hmm. you're trying to score on the power play, penalty kill, or five on five, let me just tell you, you want the support of Chill Boys because the performance brand or the bamboo brand. Wherever you want to dabble there is going to give you the most comfort and provide you the most infrastructure you need down there to help you out. Chill Boys MN. Judd loves them. Judd wears the long johns all the time. He, he claims oh, he's a them. basketball player now. Yep. Chillboys.com. Place to go. Final thoughts, but before we wrap up this edition of Judd's Hockey Show, my good man. Yeah, it's. Uh, I'm just glad the Wilder now consistently... As I knock on wood here, uh, yeah. playing games consistently after yeah. playing five games over like six weeks. I'm uh, with, amen, brother. And they're still winning games. And we are what? I think we're like two and a half, three weeks from the trade deadline. I think it's like February 20th, 18th, 19th. Couple Hold on. You know what? I'll clear that up in no, a second. That, that, someone else has a couple 13, 14 passed from this time. Um, so it's I'm, coming up. And we get to have reckless trade ideas here. And I'm excited to explore those. We just, explored a, we just gave you a little taste of 
of a Claude Giroux possibility, um, I think we'll still explore those options. And I'm excited for what we also can uh, potentially look at down the road to try to potentially improve this team. And if you want to get deep down the middle, you're going to have to give up something. But I am curious what the WoW could potentially do to do that. And it, it's just beginning here, baby. This is this is only the beginning. Yes, we don't want to get too far ahead of our skis. We don't want we don't want the Wild uh, to be putting it in the existence that they're already going to be a lock to make the Western Conference Finals. I want to see them make a deep playoff run. I think they have the tools to do so already. But do you want to put more ammunition in that chamber? I'm excited to see what Bill Green has up his sleeve over the next few weeks. Agreed completely. A trade deadline Monday, March 21st. So it's Monday, March, oh, March. 21st. So we've got we got, we've got a ton of time for our favorite thing here at Score North, reckless speculation. All right, take us home, sir. Yeah, no problem. If uh, you like what you're hearing, hit the subscribe button on this YouTube channel for daily Minnesota sports entertainment. That's Joe Dogat. I'm Declan Goff. Sans Phil Mackey, the hockey whisperer, too, by the way, who still does deliver some hockey You can weigh in tomorrow. Yep, I think he might have some takes. I think he might have some takes. And if you're a football fan, because the Vikings season, even though it might be over, the next era of Vikings football will be starting any minute from now. Head on over to our Purple Daily YouTube channel for daily Minnesota sports entertainment. The Rhino, Alex Boone, former Minnesota Vikings offensive lineman and Super Bowl guard, uh, will be joining us tomorrow for some fire football takes. So if that's your jam, head on over to the Purple Daily YouTube channel and the Score North app is a central hub for everything we do at Score North. Judd's written work, our audio work, everything is right there. For Judd, for myself, Declan Goff, Goodbye. we always wrap the show with our friend of the show, Billy Guerin, to take us home. Listen, you guys know what this is all about, right? Right? What's it all about? Spurgy? Hard work and having fun. F*** that. This is about f***ing winning.